Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to Biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's jump in where we left off last week. We're reading my notes on Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23. We're also including verse 22 just for uh, brevity or just for context. And just to remind you, we're looking at biblicalunitarian.com and their website about God and His Son Jesus Christ. They are a non Trinitarian Christian denomination that follows in the footsteps of ancient Socinianism, which rejects the pre incarnation of Jesus before he came to earth. They, I'm sorry, the pre incarnation. They reject the, um, uh, the, um, pre-existence of Jesus before his incarnation. They believe that Jesus came into the world in the first century at his birth. Therefore, when God talks about or when verses when of the Bible talk about the word which was with God and was God, like John 1, 1, and um, when we read about um, Jesus' pre-existence in other passages, which, I, I mean, I really find it hard to believe that they just have to um, carpet, uh, carte blanche, ignore all the verses where Jesus talks about, I am the, I'm the one who came down from heaven. I was sent from heaven. I'm going to return back to God. Um, you know, um, I'm going to, I was the one that, that was in heaven before. No one has ascended to heaven except the one who, no one is, yeah, the one, no one has ascended except the one who already descended, right? Meaning me. Um, things like that. They have to ignore those verses, but they are non Trinitarian. So for them, God is the only God. He's numerically one with the Father, meaning God is the Father, and the Father is God, and that's it. He's the only one that's identical to God. And yet Jesus is the human agent sent by God and glorified by God, exalted by God to sit at the right hand of God in a unique position as the Messiah of the world. He's worthy of worship because God did exalt him. He's not worthy of worship because he's God. He's only worthy of worship because God exalted him. But nevertheless, he is a human being. And the Holy Spirit is simply another name for God. So that's their perspective of the Bible that follows ancient Socinianism. What we are looking at is Proverbs 8.23, where we got the passage you can see on your screen. I, wisdom, was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. And what we're about to do is we already read this earlier, but in my discussion, I bring in their own perspective once more. But first, let's back up just one explanation from got questions where they're talking about how do we understand unitarianism and unitarians and biblical unitarian views of god and contrast those with the trinitarian view so backing up one uh short paragraph gotquestions.org reminds us biblical unitarian views of god are unbiblical because scripture clearly teaches that the son of god existed prior to all creation right we've got john 1 1 through 5 uh, we, that Jesus is truly God from Titus 2.13 that I read in my eschatology study, and that the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father, Matthew 28.19. And continuing, GodQuestions.org says, Denominations that fall under the category of Biblical Unitarianism include, besides Biblical Unitarianism themselves, BiblicalUnitarian.com, we've got the Church of God, Eternal Conference, COGGC, and the Christadelphians. They're all um, Unitarians as well. Non-Trinitarianism is widespread. I'll flash a little graphic on the screen and post. That shows you some of the many different Christian denominations who are nevertheless non-Trinitarian, like the Oneness Pentecostals, things like that. So, picking up now, I say, that being said, let us now observe what BiblicalUnitarian.com has to say in detail about the wisdom of Proverbs chapter 8. The explanation of Proverbs 8.23, provided by BiblicalUnitarian.com, is short enough to be quoted at length in my own uh, notes here. So, uh, we read this a week ago or two weeks ago. Let's, yeah, about two weeks ago, I guess, or maybe it was last week. But let's read just this part again because it's so short. This is BiblicalUnitarian.com. Occasionally, a Trinitarian will use this verse to try to support the Trinity and the pre-existence of Christ by saying that, quote, wisdom, end quote, was appointed from eternity. Christ is the, quote, wisdom of God, end quote, 1 Corinthians one twenty four, and therefore Christ was from all eternity. And so when we look at the verse, just real quick, let me jump back over to biblicalunitarian.com. Here's a render from the NIV. It says, I, and then in brackets it says, wisdom was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. If we actually pull the entire 
uh, chapter up, but focus just on verse 22 and 23. Let me scroll down to those two. Blew that up on the screen for you. Verse 22 of Proverbs 8 says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. And then verse 23 says, From everlasting I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. So, it sounds like this entity or this quality or this being, depending on how you're in translating or interpreting Proverbs, this being or this quality either was created at the beginning before everything else was created or it existed with God at the beginning, something to that effect. And we'll get to, remember I said in my own explanation, we'll turn to the Hebrew and the Greek and see if we can peel back some more understanding. But let's first continue reading what Biblical Unitarian has to say. So, continuing where I left off, their quote says, This position has not found strong support even among Trinitarians. And we're going to find out eventually that when I explain my understanding of Proverbs 8, it is one perspective from the Trinitarian camp, but indeed there are other ways that Trinitarians even spin this passage. And so when time comes, we're going to turn to Sam Shamoon's explanation as is recorded for us uh, at the website answeringislam.org. Sam Shamoon is a former Muslim turned Christian Trinitarian apologist, and he's got an interesting explanation about this particular passage that we'll get to in time as well. That slightly differs from my own perspective, but we're still both in the camp of Trinitarian. So that's why I'm bringing his into the discussion to show it's not just a clean break between Trinitarian and non Trinitarian. There are actually other slightly different Trinitarian perspectives of who or what is Lady Wisdom. Let's keep reading. So, biblicalunitarian.com says, they, and they, they, they notice this, and they, they're probably mentioning it so, that, so as to undercut the supposed uniformity of the Trinitarian perspective. This position has not found strong support even among Trinitarians, they say, as if that's a minus for our side, right? We Trinitarians, but it isn't actually. And for good reason, they say, this wisdom in Proverbs was appointed literally set up by God and is therefore subordinate to God. So remember, what biblical Unitarian and non-Trinitarians often resort to, to explain away the Trinity and explain away the equality of Jesus with his Father in terms of having the same essence, right? The same homoousius, the same Greek term there to describe the nature that Jesus shares with his Father, although they're two distinct hypostases, often mistranslated as the word person, as if they're um, people like humans, but we're talking about two different hypostatic, I'm sorry, two different hypostases that are unique from one another. So, be, um, you know, it's one being of God, but two different persons is how we feel it in English. But Biblical Unitarian and other non-Trinitarian groups often will resort to using what's known as subordinationism, which is actually a full-blown heresy in and of itself, that teaches that Jesus, even at his, in his nature, is completely subordinate to God in all aspects. But we Trinitarians don't uh, describe our understanding of Jesus that way. In his humanity, he's subordinate to God. And even as the eternal son, there's this bit of hierarchy going on where the father is the father and the son is the son, even though the father and the son are both eternal and have never ceased to exist, according to the Trinitarian way of understanding things. But Jesus is not subordinate as God to God the Father, who is somehow some greater God. So we're not describing a greater and a lesser God or a greater and a lesser Yahweh like Rabbi Moshe Koniukowski purports. But Biblical Unitarian says, no, Jesus is therefore subordinate to God because Lady Wisdom is described as someone that was set up by God, and therefore subordination is built into the description of Lady Wisdom. Carefully reading, they say, the verse and its context shows that Wisdom was, quote, brought forth as the first of his works, verse 22. Keep in mind that um, Socinianism does not espouse to a created being known as the Word of God, 
prior to the creation of the world itself. That would be the form of Christology that is labeled Arianism and is taught by today's modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses. So in this contrast between Socinianism and Arianism, which are both non-Trinitarian and which are both heretical according to Orthodox Trinitarian creeds, like the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, etc., etc., so Sinianism on the one hand, and I'll put a little chart on screen in post-production so you can see this. So Sinianism on the one hand believes that Jesus entered into the world through his human birth in the first century. By contrast, Arianism believes that the word of God is a creature that God fabricated before creating anything else. So in Arianism slash Jehovah's Witness theology and Christology, Jesus, the human being, pre-existed as the Word of God that God nevertheless created or brought forth as the first of his works. So when Jehovah's Witnesses and Arians engage this passage here in the book of Proverbs and start reading about Lady Wisdom, for them, the language speaks about a creature or a being that God created and brought forth as the first of his works, the firstborn of the creation of God. And then that creature went on to create everything else uh, besides himself. So God created this creature, and then that creature created the universe and the world and humans and everything else like that. And that's the... Um, uh, Arian slash Jehovah's Witness perspective on who the Word of God and in the you know that's why they say in the beginning was the Word the Word was with God and the Word was a God the Word was this creature that God created this demigod this little God this lesser God this mini be this lesser Yahweh which is heresy so don't get that confused with the biblical Unitarian Socinian perspective which says no there's no creature that God created at the beginning of of all time before time itself was created there, there wasn't anything like that. There was just God. God created all things. But what did exist, and we're going to read about this eventually, what did exist was this thought in the mind of God, this concept called the Word of God, which eventually became known as Jesus when the incarnation of not the Word of God, but the incarnation of the thought of God. So Jesus existed only in God's mind from eternity past. And so we're going to see later on how this just falls apart. But nevertheless, that's kind of what they've hold to. So let's keep reading their perspective from a non-Trinitarian view. If this wisdom were Christ, they say, then Christ would be the first creation of God, which is an Arian belief and heretical to Orthodox Trinitarians. So it's interesting if you put three people in the room and one was a biblical Unitarian slash Socinian, one was an Arian slash Jehovah's Witness, and the other was an Orthodox Christian Trinitarian. You put all three of them in the room, all three would disagree as to the nature of Christ. You'd have a little bit of agreement between the, oddly enough, between the Arians and the Trinitarians when it comes to Lady Wisdom, but then you'd interestingly enough have a little bit of agreement between the Socinians and the Arians when it comes to Jesus not being very fully, truly God. So it depends on how you uh, divide up your argument as to where you're gonna get some um, agreement or disagreement. Let's keep reading biblicalunitarian.com's um, explanation about Psalm. Uh, I'm sorry, about Proverbs uh, 8:23. They go on to say that therefore many of the church fathers, and we're going to read the church fathers one of these days. I'm going to do, do kind of like a little excursus. I was just reading through them this week, and uh, it's just amazing to me how many church fathers over and over um, affirm the Trinitarian perspective. And there's a specific verse out of the Book of Genesis, the very first um, kind of um, problem verse for uh, non-Trinitarians where God says, let us make man in Genesis 1 26. We're going to pour through that verse through the lens of the church fathers one of these days, and you'll see how that over and over the church fathers affirmed a Trinit an Orthodox Trinitarian position.
But biblical Unitarian says, therefore, many of the church fathers rejected this verse, speaking of Proverbs, as supportive of the Trinity, among them such heavyweights as Athanasius, Basil, Gregory, Epiphanius, and Cyril. All right. Um, and so, as if for some reason that means that since they rejected Proverbs, they're rejecting Trinity. But this is kind of a, um, this is a bit of a uh, deceptive um, explanation if you don't read it through and follow through the entirety of the lo- the argument that's trying to be presented here. Um, the church fathers that are mentioned there are not, the, they're not saying that because we reject Proverbs as being the, as being the pre-incarnate Jesus, that to be equated with them actually rejecting Trinity. But Biblical Unitarian almost wants you to believe that without, um, if you didn't go back and do your own homework and um, research on what the Church Fathers um, actually believed. So it says, we reject it also, but for different reasons, <laughs> right? As if, hey, the Church Fathers rejected Proverbs, and so since we're not Trinitarian, and because um, the Church Fathers rejected Proverbs as being, Trini- as being Trinitarian perspective, then this means that the Church Fathers must also have rejected Trinity. It's like a form of syllogism, but no, that's a false um, premise. False conclusion drawn from um, uh, a set of premises or uh, arguments, um, discussions. So let's keep reading. Um, taking a concept and speaking of it as if it were a person, right, Lady Wisdom, is the figure of speech personification. So now they're going to tell you, explain to you how that, because this is personification, it's not to be equated with declaring that wisdom is Jesus. Which again, when we're going we're gonna to see when we get to Sam Shamoon's explanation, it doesn't have to be that wisdom is in fact Jesus, at least in the book of Proverbs. But when we get to the New Testament, we find language that does equate Jesus with wisdom, the wisdom of God. And so it harkens back to the book of Proverbs, but it's not exactly the same as saying that the book of Proverbs is, is in fact speaking of Jesus. In fact, in the end, I'll just kind of tip my hand to you a little bit now. It doesn't even have to be. It doesn't have to be that weighty wisdom in the book of Proverbs is Jesus in order for the Trinitarian positions to still hold true. Right, so that's um, a little bit of what we're dealing with. So, yeah, we're talking about a little bit of personification. I'm on board with that. I'm fine with that. But I don't have to draw it to the the logical conclusion that biblical Unitarians are going to try and do by saying, quote, personification often makes it easier to relate to a concept or idea because as humans, we are familiar with relating to other humans. They go on to say that personification was common among the Jews and the wisdom of God is personified in the book of Proverbs. And they conclude by saying, Christ is considered the wisdom of God in Corinthians, ready for it, because of what God accomplishes through him. Not, I might add, because Christ is God. So that's where they're going to draw the line. Is Jesus the wisdom of God? Well, only in an accomplishment personification aspect, Jesus personifies the wisdom of God, and it's because of what God accomplishes through Christ. In other words, it's that whole idea of agency all over again, angel of the Lord, um, Jesus being the agent that God acts through. So when we read all those passages in the New Testament where it talks about through him, speaking of the word of God, through him all things were created by him and for him and through him. Uh, John talks about this in his first chapter. You know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was with God. All things were created through him. John tells us, through this word which was with God and was God, according to the Trinitarian. But the Unitarian is going to say, no, God, Jesus says God didn't create everything. Rather, God alone created everything, but Jesus was the agent through whom God created everything. And so as an agent, he is personifying all that God truly is. Meaning, wisdom is just a personification of God's. Uh, wisdom isn't really Jesus. It's just. It's just. It's God's wisdom, but Jesus personifies it uh, in a very unique way. All right.